take 52. Hello out there, I'm the oldest nerd. And in Meglos, uh, we have a situation where the doctor has actually been called in. This is a rare thing where the doctor is summoned uh, by a race that's needing help other than Earth. And so uh, on this planet, which is called uh, uh, Tagela, uh, there are two, they are an underground dwelling people because at one time uh, their planet was lush with plant life and has become in more recent years a desert. Um, and, and there are two factions, the Dions, who are the religious sect, and the Savants, who are the scientific uh, community. And uh, they're, of course, uh, at disagreement with each other. Uh, we have uh, also uh, kind of Huns, uh, represented by the gas tax, who, uh, for one reason or other, wanting to be able to live with the Dion's and the Savants, I suppose, uh, have uh, gotten in cahoots with this cactus character. Now, we've talked about in a previous video how John Nathan Turner, uh, as the producer, was interested in getting rid of the excess humor and going more scientific but somehow putting a cactus character as the bad guy uh, seems to be um, a little funnier than perhaps anyone would have attended. At any rate, this cactus does merge with a human to be able to Im impersonate the doctor, and uh, he, uh, rep he intercepts the, um, the, the uh, magistrate's call for the doctor and uh, manages to uh, put the TARDIS into a time loop where when the Doctor and Romana are repairing K-9, uh, they keep uh, going in a circle. And after about three times around, they realize what's happening and they work on how to get out of it. But it does slow them down considerably. Now, the big thing about this episode, it revolves around a power source, which apparently is malfunctioning and needs to be fixed. That's why the doctor was called in. And it is called a dodecahedron, which is basically a pentagon cube or a pentagon solid. So uh, this is a, um, a device that's about, I don't know, three feet in diameter. And uh, the uh, Masquerading doctor puts a device on it that shrinks it down to where he can put it in his pocket and get away. And the actual doctor shows up, and of course they suspect him of uh, having done that, uh, and uh, he doesn't know what's going on for a little while. And and so that's basically the plot that goes through this whole thing. And and uh, frankly, they put a lot of filler in the episodes here. Uh, in all of this uh, uh, four episodes, they probably could have done it all in two or even in one, perhaps and uh, gotten the story out. A lot of it is spent uh, uh, chasing through the jungle or um, you know, waiting for a big rock to drop on the doctor or things like that. There are a couple of things in here that I find kind of interesting. First of all, uh, they wanted to get rid of K-9 and it got out that uh, they were going to eliminate K-9 and that led to a lot of fans, especially children, who loved K-9 uh, wanting to uh, keep K-9. And so it was a big letter writing campaign to the BBC, and they're not insensitive to that kind of thing. Uh, John Nathan Turner thought that the problem with K-9 was that uh, he was always there to save the day, and uh, that was too convenient. You need to have some kind of tension, some kind of suspense as to whether the doctor is going to be able to get out. And for that reason, he didn't really like K-9 and didn't like the sonic screwdriver situation that we find in the very opening scene where the Doctor and Romana are trying to repair K-9 after having been damaged. And uh, they put in that uh, they can fix him, but his power source has to be recharged every couple of hours. And what this does is it makes him run out of batteries anytime that uh, they really need him. And so that uh, keeps this overly convenient nature of K-9 uh, uh, to a minimum. Also, uh, they wanted to cut back on the humor on this, and despite that, uh, there were a number of Tom Baker ad-libs through all four uh, episodes of the story, and uh, there's some reasonably uh, good lines. Um, uh, Many hands should make the light work. 
uh, which uh, is a pun, of course, on many hands make light work. And uh, they were trying to work on a power problem. So that was kind of a, a funny line. And, um, and uh, one of the doctor's passengers is worried about being late getting home. And he says, I'll have you back before you left. And I thought those were both good lines there. We also see some use of the doctor's costume. One of the bad guys uh, likes to collect coats and really likes the doctor's coat. And um, the doctor, uh, uh, Tom Baker, actually did like his, uh, his outfit, except for the question marks on the collar. Otherwise, uh, he thought it was a good upgrade to, uh, to his look. So uh, there were certain things that he was not completely uh, out of sync with John Nathan Turner, as it turns out. The things that I noticed about this was that uh, it was, while kind of thin on story, really, it was a, uh, uh, it was the, the sets were well done. They were believable. Uh, they weren't quite as being in a storage facility as the first story was. And uh, they made good use of their studio space. They had some, a small vegetated area uh, presumably due to a ship crashing and bringing in plant life with it or something. And uh, they show uh, a number of plants and they're able to run through here and uh, waste a lot of time uh, with uh, trying to be caught or trying not to get caught uh, in the jungle. And uh, they were able to do this all on stage. They didn't have to go out to uh, a location or anything like that in order to do this. And it was reasonably well enough done. Uh, the costuming was also good. Not everybody wore the same thing. The, uh, the scientists all wore white, you know, kind of like white coat things. And the religious all wore kind of red stuff. And the um, uh, gas tax uh, wore uh, various different things, just to look like whatever they could pick up. And uh, it all worked. It didn't look quite so unitary as uh, in a lot of science fiction shows, you know, uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld once made a joke about it. He says, I want to live in the future because then I don't have to worry about what I wear. Everybody wears the silver suit with a V in the front. And, and that's almost what you see in a lot of these science fiction shows. One of the things that influenced them also was that uh, on ITV, 15 minutes before they did, was Buck Rogers in the 25th century. It was a uh, American-made space opera, which uh, really wasn't that well done. I mean, it, it was, it had Gil Gerard in it and it had uh, uh, some other people in it that were reasonably good actors, but the stories were kind of asinine. And, um, but they did have a, a cute robot in that uh, Tweaky played by uh, a, a little person in a suit and uh, Mel Blanc doing the voice. And it, it worked okay. And uh, however, uh, it was um, causing a lot of people who would normally watch Doctor Who to watch them. And uh, part of their letter writing was, if, uh, if you don't bring K-9 back, uh, we're going to just watch Buck Rogers. So, um, you know, it's comparing apples and oranges as far as I'm concerned. But uh, at the time, uh, there was a dearth of science fiction on television. And so if Buck Rogers was on, you just watched it because that was all you're going to get. But uh, anyway, uh, they, uh, the BBC did uh, see what was going on there, and they actually moved Doctor Who up to where then they started five minutes before Buck Rogers came on, and they brought their audience back. Pretty good work with uh, cameras and lighting and uh, sets and uh, had more sets than they usually do. So you have the spaceship, you have the underground city, you have uh, the, the jungle, and, um, and of course the TARDIS. And so uh, all of these things um, gave you a sense of space where uh, you don't normally get it at this uh, time in the, in the uh, productions. If I haven't mentioned this before, this is when Tom Baker pretty much decided after this show was uh, produced, uh, it was when Tom Baker decided that uh, perhaps he shouldn't be the doctor anymore. His run-ins with John Nathan Turner and other members of the production staff and uh, his tendency to be the, you know, the star that's been there for five or six years already uh, that was uh, throwing his weight around and that was getting uh, kind of short on most of the uh, people in the production although his star power was still there. But uh, it was kind of a, uh, I'm tired of doing this fight and Tom backs out and 
the producers basically say, well, sorry to see you go, but maybe we can find somebody that we can work with easier. And, and it left on that point. So um, at uh, an interview with, uh, uh, with one of the news channels after uh, the announcement was made, uh, Tom Baker basically said, you know, I don't know what they're going to do and I don't know what I'm going to do either. And it turns out uh, he did some stage work after that. And uh, of course, uh, the BBC went on and hired uh, Peter Davison to be the next doctor. But there are still six more adventures uh, before all is said and done. So we'll be following them on this channel. So if you um, would like to make a comment, please do so below. And if you have not subscribed or clicked your like button, your thumbs up button, uh, please do that. And until next time, don't go far.